Good evening. How's your energy level? Okay. Surprisingly alert for uh, near the end of the conference, not, not quite the end of the conference. Joseph and I have been talking for um, maybe a year or so now um, about China and Brazil. And my standard mantra has been, this is just the beginning. If you go back five, seven years from now, China was probably not a topic pe most people dealt with. If you were in agriculture and natural resources, maybe from infrastructure, you might have had some engagement with China. But barely, it really was not that big a deal. Fast forward just five to six years, China is the world's largest car market. It's the world's largest retail market, largest e-commerce market. We've got the world's largest ride-sharing market, Didi, now in Brazil. Uh, Hollywood movies, online gaming, offline gaming, gambling. It's every six months there's a new China is the world's largest market of announcement. So whatever industry you're in, for most industries, not all, this is moving closer and closer to your world in some form. And my sort of take on this is, look, this is just the beginning. This is five to six years. Imagine where we'll be in another five. So what we've been doing and what we've sort of started doing a little bit is, is giving talks around Brazil, companies, executives, as sort of a first step. Look, everyone has to start somewhere. This is a first step. So we had a session yesterday for about six hours. We just started talking. Uh, get people a little bit up to speed, get them moving, and then from there, you know, it'll go next step, next step, and before you know it, you'll be a China expert. That's how I started, that's how Joseph, that's how everyone starts. It's not actually that complicated. People think it is because it's a little mysterious China. It's just business. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing is how to start to open the conversation, get people talking, get people reading, learning, and then as this becomes more and more significant, um, I think it's, it's pointing in the right direction. So that's kind of what we've been doing. All right. I'm just going to give you a couple updates from what I think is happening right now in Beijing, in China. To a large degree, I've sort of steered this to as I think it relates to Brazil. But I'm not a Brazil expert in any way, shape, or form. So I'll tell you the China side of the equation. Or at least I'll raise the questions. Um, so just really four updates from digital and consumer China. I focus on Chinese consumers and digital China, which used to be two separate subjects. Now they are more or less the same subject. Anytime you're talking about Chinese consumers, you're talking about a smartphone, because everything goes through the smartphone. Um, I do a lot of writing on this. I won't go through that. A lot of talking, writing in China. In my day job, I, this is professor writer stuff. In my day job, I do a lot of private equity M&A advisory stuff between the US and China. Uh, Peking University, this is China Europe International Business School, which is really, I think, one of the best schools in China for an MBA. It's based in Shanghai, a little bit of Cambridge, Columbia. I used to be a doctor. I'm not a doctor anymore. Uh, if, if you have a medical condition at any time during this talk, I am of no use um, to anyone. <laughs> Beijing and China. Uh, I think he mentioned this. We wrote this little book. And that we, 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 what we wrote this book for, this is Jonathan Wetzel, who is a senior partner at McKinsey in China. He's really the person that opened their office there in 1994. Incredibly smart. We write books together. We teach together. This book was written for very smart but busy people who want to start thinking about China. So, so we said, look, if we had a really great senior executive, CEO, vice president, we had their attention for an hour. This is what we would say in the meeting. Uh, but it's for people who think this is getting important but don't have a lot of time to read six, five big, huge China books. It's not going to happen. So this is kind of like almost like a brief. And we sell it for almost nothing. I'm not pitching it to make money. It's like $4 online. It's, it's just something we, we tried to write to be helpful. Um, I won't go through this. Before, that's I used to work for a man named Al-Walid, who is the the wealthiest person in the Middle East. That was my boss for a long time. I won't go through that. Um, and I've also been taking students from China out to meet Warren Buffett for the last couple of years. That's an awesome example of how not to take a photo if you were ever in the photo with Warren Buffett. <laughs> I did a better job this January, see? Um, anyways, okay, 
four takeaways, four updates, four lessons. This is, I think, some of the coolest stuff happening. Some of it relates to Brazil, not entirely. Uh, number one, retail is getting turned on its head. Uh, there's a lot of digital disruption in the world, digital, digital transformation. What's happening in retail in China is stunning. It, it's amazing how fast it's happening. It makes what Amazon is doing in the U.S. look like nothing. They are slow. They're, they are undaring. China is the front lines of digital transformation of retail anywhere in the world. Here's a couple examples. Uh, 2017, Jack Ma, who retired, announced his retirement on Monday, for those who might have heard that. He announces this big sweeping initiative with the least interesting name ever created. He calls it New Retail. Literally, you can't think up a less interesting name than that for this. He starts with doing, I won't, that's too much text for a, a slide. Um, but basically, he starts to say, we have online e-commerce, we have a fairly undeveloped retail industry of China in the physical world, because it's still a developing economy. It ain't Walmart. We're going to merge them. We're going to take all the physical assets, the stores, we're going to combine them with the online. And what the consumer is going to see is one seamless, data-driven consumer experience that incorporates everything. Supermarkets mom and pop stores, convenience stores with no cashiers, pop-up stores, department stores, packages, scooter, bicycle delivery. I can sit in my office in Beijing, pick up my phone, say I want a cup of coffee, click it, it pays with a digital mobile payment, someone will write up to me in about eight minutes and say here's your coffee. That's what's happening. Like, it's not a, that's actually not that profitable, but um, Here's an example. This is the supermarkets that Alibaba's rolling out. You walk into the supermarket, it looks like a supermarket, but then there's a whole fresh food area. These are lobsters. You take out your phone, you scan the barcode, it tells you about the lobsters in the tank, where they were caught, how long they've been there. I can order them. Everything's on your phone. There's no cash involved in any of this. I don't have to be in the store to do this. I can do this from my office. I can then have it cooked in the store and on my way home, I may swing by the store and I'll pick it up, cooked in the store, have my lobster. I may have also, at the same time, pick up things I've purchased online, a bottle of wine, uh, a digital movie, a new pair of sneakers. They will be in the back of the store because it also operates as a logistics hub. It's a service center meets a supermarket meets a logistics hub, all within two to three kilometers of my house. They will deliver to my house someone on a bicycle in about 30 minutes, anything I want. 50% of the orders being processed by these stores are happening on people's phones outside of the stores. And this is sort of one of the first frontiers of like grocery going e-commerce, going new retail. This is Jingdong, JD, everyone calls it JD here. Um, JD stands for Jingdong. Uh, see, Jingdong. Um, <laughs> that's Jingdong. Actually, in Chinese, it's Jingdong, but in, uh, in, it also means Tokyo um, in Japanese. Anyways, um, this is a cashierless convenience store. You walk up. This one's a little less advanced. You walk up. The door's open. There's a scanner here. On the more advanced ones, you walk up. There's a sliding gas door. There's a screen. It walks up. It sees you. It, knows, it recognizes my face. It opens the door based on it knows who I am if I have a file. If it doesn't have a file on me, which everyone has a file, it can tell me things like, oh, this is how old you are, which is weird. Uh, it just points up and it tells, because it can do facial stuff. You walk in, you take what you want. Maybe you walk to a scanner, you scan it, you either pay with your face or you pay with your phone. Take what you walk on. They're rolling out tens of thousands of these. They're putting these in offices. So you walk into anyone's office building, you go down the hallway, you'll see little counters like this. And you just go up and grab stuff, scan it, take it. The company that puts these in offices rolled out 50,000 of them last year. Everything's big in China, so it's always got like an extra zero. So it's 50,000. Uh, autonomous vehicles. These things are JD. They're rolling around the campus. This is the same thing you order. Um, on your phone, whatever, it goes into the little cart. These doors, 
these things ramble along. Right now it's in business parks and campuses. It's not on the streets yet because that's regulatory, little problems. You walk up, you scan it with your phone, the thing pops open and hands you whatever you bought, a microphone. Drones. This drone is about as big as those two chairs together. You could get on that drone and fly it like a horse. It can carry 150 kilograms. They have drone fleets taking off that are used for logistics. They're moving stuff. They may deliver with them, but right now it's just between warehouses. This is also JD. JD's rolling out smart appliances, smart oven, smart stove, smart rice cooker, I think. You go up, you take something out of your fridge, it's a Coke, it registers that you took the Coke, it immediately places an order through your account on JD, someone comes up and either delivers new Cokes to your house, or if you really want, which may happen, is they may just come in your house and put them in there. People are thinking about that one. But basically all your devices are getting smart and they're connecting into the e-commerce ecosystem. This is the warehouse, JD. That's their new automated warehouse, which has nobody in it. It's, well, very few people. Here's a video that they just, that they just uh, put up recently. This is the JD Logistics, maybe Vision, probably. Let me get out of the way. This is actually a couple minutes here. Um, Suppliers deliver to the warehouse. The first thing they do is sort them into various crates and put them in location so suddenly they have their inventory stocked. So this is the stocking. They move on these devices that move around on their own. They're building these robots internally. They have a robotics lab in Beijing where they have scientists building robots that do this. They're also building the drones internally. This is the part that's maybe a bit more speculative. The warehouses assemble, these would be supply boxes, go into capsules or trucks. And these in theory go underground to their other main logistics hubs. They're doing that with trucks right now. The tubes may be a bit of a dream. Depends where you are. Beijing is not going to let you build tubes under the city. It's just not going to happen, but other cities maybe. Sorting facility. So you go from the sorting facility downtown. This video is a little bit long, this part. Then we go into the convenience stores. So in theory, these go right in. You'll have some staff that need to stock, but by and large, you're not gonna have very many people involved. They can come into the autonomous vehicles, which then go out to deliver. In theory, they can go into office buildings, up the escalators, down the elevators, and they can go out onto the drones. Anyway, so that's their latest vision for what they're building. That's the JD headquarters in Beijing. That's the new building they just opened. That's got 15,000 people. They're building another one next to it. They're building another one next to it. They're up to about 160,000 people now. 
that number was about 100 at the start, maybe in December. Uh, you go back to 2011, that number was probably 10,000 employees. Their revenue has gone up by tenfold in the last five years. That's how fast they're, they're growing. It's crazy. That's the back of the building. The new one's going over there, the new one's going over there. It's a bunch of Italian students I brought. Um, <laughs> we brought them to China and we sent them around town without cash. We just gave them cell phones and they had to go through life without cash, buy things, get a cup of coffee, all that. That was pretty fun. Okay, that's kind of the big, that's a lot of the new retail. Like it's, it's all over the map. It's cashier stores, it's digital mom and pop stores, it's department stores, it's luxury. So they're taking each segment and sort of rethinking it with this integration of online and offline. And then on top of this, because it's China, uh, there's just surprises after, there's stuff we never saw coming. Happens all the time. This is karaoke. This is from the subway. If you're on the subway in China, Beijing, you walk down and they have these booths. You walk up, you scan it with your phone, the door opens, there's two stools, one for you and a friend. You sing a couple songs. <laughs> it's real. People are in them all the time. They're in shopping malls, they're in the subway. It's another popular one that just rolled out this year. They squeeze oranges. This father's buying orange juice for his two daughters. You see, this one's all over the place this year. They just pop. This stuff happens like every month something new like this happens. Okay, that's sort of point number one to keep in mind. If you're thinking anything retail, look at China because it's really moving right now. All right, point number two. Next on the list after retail, mobility. Mobility's up for disruption in a major way. Um, this is pretty much what China looked like in 1980. You go back to 1980, 80% 80 of the population was rural, agricultural, farms, small villages, compared to, say, the United States at the same time, 80% of people lived in cities. Japan, well, 70%. Japan, probably 80%. Brazil, probably 60, 50%. China was a very rural country in the 1980s. What's been happening is this process of urbanization. Everyone's moving into the cities. There's just a wave of people. We're about 55% of China's population lives in cities right now. That's about 800, 900 million people. There's 1.4 million, billion. So we got another 300 million on the way if it gets up to US, Europe levels. So a lot of this mobility stuff that people talk about is the fact that every year, the population of the Netherlands moves into the cities of, Japan, of China and you just have to keep building. You have to keep building roads and bridges and subways and a lot of this mobility stuff is about dealing with the fact that you're about to have the world's largest urban population. Um, in theory, according to McKinsey, in 2025, do we have time here? In 2025, there will be about a billion people that live in Chinese cities. That's the number to remember, one billion. Nobody has any idea what that's gonna mean because nobody's ever seen a billion people live in cities before. All of North America, all South America combined is not a billion people. Right now, in, to meet this movement of people, so basically what's happening in China is they've been playing catch up. While the rest of the world urbanized and moved into cities and built factories in the 1800s, 1900s, China stayed rural. They're catching up. It's just happening real fast. You keep building. You need more cops. You need more parks. You need more grocery stores. You need more everything. It's really playing out in mobility and transportation in a big way. For example, here's the Shenzhen subway, 2003. Here's last year. And here's 2020. And they're on target. They make the deadlines, which is amazing. They keep having these deadlines for what they're going to hit, and they keep hitting it. Um, here's the 1 billion. Basically, 600, 700 million people live in cities today. We're going to a billion. That means we have another 300 billion people on the way. So when you look at the billionaires list of China, half the list is real estate people. Because you just have to keep building apartments to handle this inflow. Um, basically, it's like adding the population of Japan every eight years. 
You need lots of apartments, you need buses, you need subways, you need water. Water is a big problem in China. It's one of the biggest scarce issues in China is water, water and oil. It's a very dry country. There's very little water in China. What we're going to have is right now we have about 160 Chinese cities with over a million people. Europe has 35. That number is going to 220. We're building these massive cities. 14 cities over 5 million people. This is going up to 23. So that's why when people, did I do that? So people think about bikes, right? The bikes are coming to Brazil. The China. Why did this happen in China? Because you're having 600, 700 million people live in cities. Getting around is a big problem. Uh, and there's a history of riding bikes in China as well. So this very innovative company came up with the idea of bike sharing. Um, that's Mobike. Launched in 2016, nobody saw it coming. If you had asked venture capitalists in 2015 to list the top 50 things that are going to happen, bikes wouldn't have been on the list. Nobody saw it coming. Um, Mobike launched in Shanghai, Ofo, the yellow ones, launched in Beijing. 30 competitors jumped in very, very quickly because that's what always happens. The two leaders put 12 million bikes on the streets in about a year and a half. Uh, happened very quick. Nobody saw it coming. And the bike manufacturers especially didn't see it coming. The people who were buying bikes with, hey, please buy this bicycle, you know had no idea that we were all going to start riding like this. Now, one of the things, because 30 people jumped in, they were all different colors. You had the yellow bikes, you had the, well, they ran out of colors pretty quick because they had 30 competitors. <laughs> so they started to combine different colors. The gold ones were like, good luck. If you saw a gold one, it was like a good day. Um, <laughs> there's a blue go-go. Um, there's a yellow ofo. Uh, so what does that mean? This is, this is a year in the life of one Mobike. This is Shanghai. These bikes are designed to be left on their own for years. So this is the, core, this is the one year of this bicycle. Jumps the river. I've never figured out how it gets across the river. It's going to jump in a sec. I talk to the Mobike people a lot, and they, they do move these bikes around a little bit. They have people in carts, because they say like all the bikes tend to end up at the bottom of hills. Like People don't leave them at the top of hills, they leave them at the bottom. And if a bike goes too far outwards, it tends to just keep going, so they have to go get it before it goes too far. See there, it just jumped. Um, so there was a couple things that are interesting. The one, urbanization, it's a big deal in China. The other thing that was big, on these bikes was they really did rethink the whole business model. Nobody had ever thought about this idea, really, of let's create an asset and we'll just take it downtown, we'll put it on the street, and we'll just leave it. How many people here would build an asset like a bicycle, take it down to Sao Paulo, just leave it on the streets, take it out of the trucks, and just go home? It was a weird thing to do. And when they first did this, like a lot of them got stolen, right? Um, and then people corrected their behavior and it's fine. But there's a lot of this sort of innovation. Now they're doing it with scooters. This is Mango. It's basically the same business, but it's scooters. This business just took off in the US, the Link. I think they're called Lynx. The US companies are doing the same model now where they're leaving scooters all over San Francisco that you can ride. Uh, Mobike and Ofo, Mobike especially, have launched in Mexico. Um, they launched in Chile. They started a little bit in Brazil earlier this year. Curitiba, I think, is where they started. Uh, and now you have the new company here, Yellow Bikes, um, which looks suspiciously like the Ofo bikes. Um, <laughs> more power to you. Um, so you can kind of see China tends to lead on transportation and mobility because they have more problems. So bikes came first, but now we see them rippling out in different ways. Uh, scooters, rental scooters. Now they have these little carts. Um, getting a driver's license is very, very difficult. Um, you have to wait a long time. It's very, very expensive.
but electric scooters are unregulated. So a lot of people have electric scooters. So these are electric carts that people have started to put these shells around, so they look like small cars. But they're not. They're electric carts, and you don't need a license. So people zoom all over the place. So there's little Mercedes, and there's little Hummers, and they're all about 30% smaller than the real thing. So you see these all over the place now. So you have electric carts. You have sort of the scooters. This is kind of what's coming next is um, mobility. And, and what everyone is, not everyone, the biggest companies, particularly Didi, who is really the giant of ride sharing in, in China, they're focused on electric autonomous vehicles that drive themselves. And they have a new alliance they've put together, DD Alliance, which is 31 automakers and other companies, all building standardized vehicles that just move on their own and other things. So that's kind of like, if retail is the big frontier right now, mobility is probably the next one. And I think we'll see a lot of this ripple, especially to, base, to Brazil. Because a lot of what works in China can work here. And it actually, I think it works here better than, say, a lot of what happens in the US. So that would be the next one to keep an eye on, is mobility. All right, point three, how are we doing on time? Oh, it's right on the big screens facing me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> OK. Now, take this with a grain of salt. But these are the things I think about when I'm sort of here quite a bit. This chart I think about a lot. This is GDP per capita, China versus India, really starting 1990. The two countries were very similar. Similar population size, similar GDP per capita, about 1,000. Both rel really quite poor countries. Same big geography. What happened? I mean, China's up to about seven or 8,000 GDP per capita. India's still one to 2,000. China grows by the size of India's economy like every two years now. Like, that's one of the big questions. What happened? I, I mean, India definitely thinks about this. Um, and, you know, Brazil is more of a up and down. Um, but why do you see this sort of pattern in China and you don't see it in too many other developing economies? What are they doing that gets them this? Now, I asked basically Warren Buffett. Oh, that's a bad slide. I'm sorry. That's too much text. I asked sort of Warren Buffett the same thing. And he basically said, they're compounding. This is, this is just wealth compounding. Um, they're not growing at 50% a year. They're not growing at 25% a year. They're growing at 10%, 8%, 6% consistently. So they grow 10%. The next year, they're growing 10% of a bigger number. Then they're growing 10% of another bigger number. And if you do that long enough, you start to get an exponential. If you look at Warren Buffett's wealth, he's a compounder. He grew his company at 18 to 20% every year, like clockwork. His wealth looks exactly like that curve. You know, he made 99% of his wealth after age 50. Compounding, I mean, China's a compounder. Now, the compounding's awesome if you can do it. The problem is if you have one or two down years, you ruin the whole effect. You have to be, consistency's more important than big growth. He basically said China has figured out a secret sauce to compound wealth. Um, he says the same thing about the U.S. I mean, it grows at 3 to 5%, but it's been doing it consistently for 50 or 60 years, and that's what matters most. Um, China has figured out how to compound consistently. Um, I always like, this is my example that I like, is if you fold a piece of paper in half, you double its width. If you do it again, you double it again. You do it 47 times, you can reach the moon. I mean, that's compounding, right? Um, so why, how can China compound and so many other developing economies cannot? Uh, and they're still doing it. They're still going up 5 6%. But the difference is now they're on the vertical part of the curve. So every year, it grows up a lot. Um, I mean, China is state capitalism. China is highly regulated. The government is involved in most every aspect of business. That is not unlike a country like Brazil with a relatively large government role. Um, the most common way people do business in China is you play by the rules. The old joke is 
in India, the key to becoming successful is overcoming the government. In China, it's about working with the government. People who do well work effectively with the government. Banks, telecommunications, railroads, all of this is government infused, insurance. You work effectively with the government and help them achieve their aims. That's the number one strategy. And if the government is not interested in something developing like news media, funeral business, you basically stay away from it. You can try, but you're not gonna get anywhere. And every now and then the government puts out a new call that says we wanna develop solar and solar takes off like crazy and goes forward. One belt, one road. Uh, electric vehicles, sports. The government put out a call a couple years ago, we want sports to be a $250 billion industry. All the business people came running. So you kind of, it's like they, flat, they flash the bat signal and everybody comes. One belt, one road is huge. Okay, so that's sort of strategy number one. Strategy number two is China does something I don't know too many other countries do. They let you break the rules. When the companies deployed 12 million bikes on the streets of China, that was totally illegal. Everyone knew it was illegal. And the government just kind of said, it's fine, go ahead. There was an interest in letting the ambitious run and letting the innovators maybe cause a certain amount of disruption in our lives, which they did. You couldn't walk across the street with so many silly bikes everywhere. They accepted a certain amount of nuisance and problems and breaking of the rules in the interest of, of innovation. Uh, you could never deploy 10,000 bicycles in London on a Thursday and think the government, the cops aren't going to call and say, what are you doing? That's more or less what these companies did. And they put 12 million of them all during a period it was probably illegal. And then about a year or two after, they came in with some basic regulations to curb the excesses, but they gave them room to run. And they did the same thing with ride sharing. Didi and Uber had a big battle in China in ride sharing. They spent billions on subsidies. Uh, Didi finally won, Uber merged in. All during that ride sharing was illegal. Everyone knew it was illegal. And the government was kind of, it's fine, go ahead. They didn't want to stymie the innovation. And then after the fact, about a year or two later, they came in with some regulations. You see this pattern a lot. Alibaba broke into money markets. Ping on broke into insurance. They will let you break the rules to some degree if it's in the interest of ambition and innovation and it's good for the country. They'll just kind of say, look, we know what's on the rules. We're not enforcing those right now. There's always two questions. What are the rules? What's being enforced right now? And they will signal. Doesn't always work. Tencent is having trouble. A company called Totiao, which is a company, healthcare. Some of those companies are being reined in right now. P2P lending, cryptocurrency got shut down very quickly. So that strategy doesn't always work. My general advice is don't try and reform, just disrupt. Smartphones that go direct to consumers, digital tools, software, AI are a great way to attack maybe a bit of a stagnant industry. Don't try and reform a bureaucratic industry, just disrupt it. All right, last point, 10 minutes. Basically, get ready for Chinese consumers because they're coming to Brazil. They haven't really come here in huge numbers yet. There's probably about I looked at the numbers recently. Tourists from China into Brazil last year was something like 60,000, 70,000, something like that. You go back to 2001, there were very few Chinese tourists, 20 million, something like that. The vast majority of China had never had a passport. The vast majority had never been on a plane. Last year, Chinese tourists numbered 140 million. They are the largest tourist group on the country. They haven't quite figured out Brazil is cool yet. It's like just not on the radar, but they're going to figure it out and they'll come. Uh, Chinese tourists also spend more per capita per tourist than any other tourist group on the planet. They're the biggest spending tourists in the world. Um, May 2014, and they also like to go in groups sometimes. Now it's more individual, but there's, sometimes they go in groups, and sometimes the groups get big. So May 2014, a group of Chinese tourists took off for a trip to LA. 
It was a 7,000 person group of tourists. They boarded 86 planes, they've occupied 26 hotels, and they've drove around LA in 160 buses. And they would all go to the same place. So it's like, we're going to see the museum. And 160 buses would go. Go online, you can see the pictures of them all showing up at like Disneyland and places. So you'll see, you go anywhere in, in Asia now, you'll see Chinese tourists absolutely everywhere. And beyond tourists, where the tourists go, the businesses follow. Once the tourists come somewhere, places like Alipay and Alibaba will come to give them payment solutions. You go anywhere in Thailand now, everyone takes Alipay because Chinese tourists are there, the merchants all have to take it. So when the tourists come, that's first. Then comes things like Alipay, Union Pay, the credit card. Then the businesses tend to follow because they have to follow their customers. The businesses come, usually following them, the big banks come because they serve the businesses. It's kind of a pattern. Uh, so they're on the way. Um, they do interesting things. Um, once you get into Chinese consumers as a demographic, you realize it's incredibly complicated. You can spend a lot of time studying little tiny demographics that are actually huge numbers of people, but they're niches. Chinese brides are a huge consumer demographic. One of the things they like to do is they like to take photos um, in pretty places. So if you go to the Central Park in New York, any Saturday and Sunday, you can find 10, 20, 30 Chinese brides walking around in their dresses. <laughs> this is Qingdao, it's a popular place to take photos. They all showed up independently. Um, there's a famous, um, in the south of France, there's lavender fields, very famous photos. This is a popular place to take photos, so Chinese brides and their spouse in the tuxedo will go and take photos. However, they like to take in the same spots. So recently, in the last couple of years, they've been getting into fights. <laughs> There's awesome videos on YouTube. Look up <laughs> Chinese brides fighting France, and you'll see videos, and the, the brides in their dresses are going at it, and the two husbands are going at it in the field. So brides are missing. Seniors. Seniors are a very big demographic. They are traveling more and more. Uh, they're buying apartments. It's usually the children that have the money. This is not a wealthy demographic. They were kind of before the opening of China. One thing they do like to do, especially the women, they like to dance in the square. They call them the dancing grannies. Um, they line up. If you go to Carrefour in Shanghai, once the store closes, the whole front of the Carrefour will be filled with relatively senior Chinese women dancing in rows. Um, this has gotten them into some issues because they like to, to dance in these squares and the people who live in the apartments have, don't really like this because they blast their music. And so there's every month or so in China there's an article in the paper about another fight between the grannies and the apartment dwellers. <laughs> and the, the grannies will bring, you know, the, they'll cut the power cords for the speakers and then the grannies will have battery powered ones the next day. <laughs> And then the, the residents will buy big speakers, mount them on the balconies, and blast rock music down so they can't dance well. It goes on all the time. There's all these sorts of sports consumers. The most popular soccer fans in the world, the football fans, are not Brazilian, they're not Italian, they're Chinese. Chinese are the most enthusiastic soccer fans on the planet. So you can dig into this group. Inland consumers. Most of China, when we talk about it, we're talking about the East Coast. There's 50% of the country that people don't talk about. They call it China's big backyard. Uh, it's a massive land mass. It has 200 million people. They are much lower incomes. This is a whole new demographic that's just sort of showing up right now. And so the point of that is like, all of this is coming to you. And you have to get out of the macro numbers, and you have to start looking at small demographics, because they're all kind of big. But it's really fun, because there's good stories all the time. Uh, they started buying avocados this year. That was like a story this year. Like, Chinese consumers had never really eaten avocados. Because there aren't any avocados in Chinese food. But they sort of discovered it this year. There was a big marketing campaign called Mr. Avocado. And they started to discover this, and avocado exports to China from Mexico went up 300% in one year. 
because there's a lot of them. So this kind of stuff happens all the time. Whenever they find something interesting, it's a real spike in activity. OK, three minutes. Last question. I've been asking this in Brazil, and I'm very disappointed. Because Brazilians own, like, how much of the world's beer now? 60%? 50 of the? It's crazy. What's the world's most popular beer by volume? Not Skull. Did I, tell, I used to think Skull was hello when I first came to Brazil, because I would, I would walk along Ipanema, and people kept coming up to me and going, Skull, Skullbeats, Skullbeats. I literally didn't know what that, that was just high. I was like, hey. Um, turns out it's beer. Number one beer in the world by volume. See, I've yet to find anyone in Brazil who knows the answer to this question. Snow. Snow beer. It's a Chinese beer. It was 50% owned by S.A.B. Miller. Uh, it used to be it was 50% owned by a Chinese state-owned enterprise, China Resources Enterprise, and S.A.B. Miller. Very popular. But then when uh, the George A. Paolo and them bought S.A.B. Miller, the condition the Chinese government put on approval of the deal you know, Europe had to approve it, US had to approve it, China had to approve it. China's condition was they had to sell their 50% interest in snow. It's called CR snow. That's the number one beer by volume. It's not awesome. Um, how many of the top 10 beers of the world are Brazilian? No, not one. Number one is snow, that's Chinese. Number two is Tsingtao, that's Chinese. Bud Light, Budweiser are both Brazilian, technically. <laughs> Skoll. Yanjing is a beer from China. Um, Brahma, there we go. So like three or four are Chinese and probably four are Brazilian now. So who owns the world's beer markets? Uh, Brazil and China, for the most part. OK, anyways, that's my last point on this one. But sort of four points. New retail, keep an eye on mobility. Um, this developing compounding question I haven't quite gotten my brain around and then get ready for Chinese consumers because they're coming and that's it that's B Peking University the skies are never that blue um, but if I can be of any help to anyone I can be whoops I can be uh, contacted right there so thank you much for your time and have a great night <laughs>